Well, who here knows that there's a really big difference between saying you love somebody and actually showing somebody love? There's a really big difference between talking about loving somebody and actually walking in love towards that person. It's like this. You know, I I tell my wife every day, every day, several times a day, honey, I love you. But if I never back those words up by serving her, by sacrificing for her, by spending time with her, then my words are empty. They don't really mean anything because I'm not actually demonstrating my love to her through action. And the Bible says over and over and over again that God loves you. But the Bible does not just merely say that God loves you. The Bible actually tells us how God tangibly showed his love for us through action. How he demonstrated his great love for us through action. And so, If you're just now joining us, I want to welcome you. Glad you're here today. If you're with us and you've been with us for a while, you know we've been going through the book of Romans in a series we've been calling Good News for You. Today we're continuing that series by going through Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 11. And as we go through these verses today, I want to talk to you from the title of The Greatest Demonstration of Love. The Greatest Demonstration of Love. Of love. Our mission here at Arroyo Church is knowing and showing the love of Jesus in the Bay Area and beyond. Now, I'll say this there's a really big difference between knowing about Jesus' love and actually knowing Jesus' love personally. And here's what I've noticed is one of the biggest differences between people that know about the love of Jesus and those that truly know Jesus' love in their life personally, experientially, in a way that actually changes and transforms their lives, here's one of the biggest difference. Is those that only know about Jesus' love, they may have heard the truths. They may have heard of John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. All those things. Like They've heard the verses. They've heard the phrase, Jesus loves you, God loves you. But that's all it is. It's just a phrase. It's just a truth detached from an actual person, detached from actual action. See, those that actually experience Jesus' love have actually understood how God's love is actually attached to an action, that he actually demonstrated his love for us, and they know what that is, and they know what that means for their lives and how it can change their lives. And so today, as we go through this passage of Scripture today, and we look at the greatest demonstration of love, I believe that as we look at Three truths today from this passage about how this greatest love was demonstrated. That as we go through it, you will have a greater understanding of how Christ demonstrated his love towards you and how even today he's demonstrating his love towards you. And I believe that as you understand and have a deeper experience of his love for you, it will change your life. So let's get started. Uh, The first way that we know God demonstrated his love for us is that God demonstrated his love by sacrificing himself, by sacrificing himself. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8, one of the most famous verses in all of scripture, which, by the way, I feel like I'm saying that almost every week as we're going through Romans, but that's just how it is, because Romans is such an incredible book, such an impactful book. Romans 5, 6 to 8, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrates his love for you by sacrificing himself for you. And you see, what this does is this shows us what love is, and it also shows us what love isn't. What love is not is love is not a feeling. I mean, you watch any Disney movie, that's basically how they're going to define love. Love is a feeling. Now, here's the thing. Love can cause feelings. But love itself is not a feeling. According to the Bible, love is a sacrificial action done for the benefit of another person. That's what love is. And here, in these incredible three verses, we see two different ways that God loves us sacrificially. First, we see that God loves us sacrificially because he loves us when we're powerless. 
that God loves us even when we're completely powerless to save ourselves. It says that while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, which means when you were completely powerless to be able to save yourself from the consequences of your sin, when you were completely powerless to save yourself from hell, when you were completely powerless to work your way back to God, when you were completely powerless, God looked at you and he loved you. God looked at you and he said, I love you so much, I'll sacrifice my very life for you. And you see, here's the problem, though. The problem is, in our culture today, is most people think they have the power. Most people think they have the power to be able to save themselves, save themselves from their, from, from their, from their sin by their own efforts, by their own good works, because they're better than most people. But the Bible flies in the face of that and says, actually, You don't have the power. No person has the power. We're all powerless. You know, a few weeks ago, uh, I got a a newer car because my old car, the transmission, was about to die. And so I decided to, to trade it in. I got a new car. And within a week of getting the new car, the battery died on me. I was like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like the old transition and the other car died. Now I got a new car. The battery's dying in the first week. Are you kidding me? So, you know, you've had to all, most of us have had to do this before. Your, your battery dies, so what do you got to do? Somebody's got to come with the jumper cables, and they give power back to your car when the battery has died. Now, here's the thing. My car could not jumpstart itself. It was completely powerless. It needed outside intervention. And you see, it's the same with you and me, we are completely powerless. We cannot jumpstart our own souls. We cannot save ourselves. But the good news of the gospel is God loves powerless people. You see, the bad news is we're powerless. We cannot save ourselves. The good news is that the all-powerful, all-loving God swoops down to save us when we could not save ourselves. This is the gospel. This is God's love demonstrated to us. This is the greatest demonstration of love, that God loved us while we were on, had no way to save ourselves, while we were powerless. Now, here's what's incredible, is there is power in admitting you're powerless. You see, the world says you're powerful when you and your own strength can conquer everything yourself. The Bible actually teaches the exact opposite, that the way you become powerful is realizing you're powerless. Because it's when you realize you're powerless that you open yourself up to the all-powerful God to save you and to change you and to use you in incredible ways. The most powerful people that have ever been used by God were the people that had the greatest sense of their powerlessness. God cannot use people that think they're powerful on their own. He can't do it. But here's what he can do when you realize you're powerless and you cannot save yourself. And apart from him, you are nothing. And apart from him, you can do nothing. When you realize that, he comes into your life and he saves you and he forgives you of your sins and he fills you with his spirit and he sends you out on mission into the world. God demonstrates his love to powerless people because he loves powerless people. But then secondly, we see... The other way that God sacrificially loves us is that he sacrificially loves you in the middle of your mess. That famous verse, Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says, While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice it doesn't say, after you cleaned yourself up and got your life together, God loved you. No, what does it say? It says, while you were still a sinner, he loved you and he died for you. He loves you in the middle of your mess. Why? Because he has a father heart. He looks at you as his child and he says, yeah, I don't love the the mess. In fact, I, I hate the mess. But you know what? I love you even though you're messy. You know, it's like me with my daughters. I got Ariella, two and a half, Noel, she's four months old. I don't even know on average how many diapers I change a day, but it's ridiculous, okay? It's like they're just, it's a diaper factory at my house. It just, it never stops, okay? It's just like, just constantly, just going. It's like, okay, when is this ever going to stop? It's just the season we're in. It's all good. But several times over the last few years, there have been moments where there's like these, you know what I'm talking about? Like these blowouts, where it's like, how does a human this little 
produce something like this powerful and this explosive. Like, how is this happening right now? It gets everywhere. Yeah, it destroys their clothes. It comes out of the diaper. It's like, what is going on here? Now, in that moment, as their father, I got to tell you, I don't like that mess. In fact, I hate it. It's like, I, I, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish that wasn't a part of parenting, but it is. So I hate the mess, but you know what? I, I, I don't hate them because they're my daughters, and I love them, and I would do anything for them. I would die for them. And you see, God has a father heart, so he looks at you in the middle of your sin. He looks at you in the middle of your mess. He says, yeah, I don't like your sin. I don't like your sin because I don't like what it does to our relationship. I don't not like what it does to your relationships with other people, and I don't like what it does to you. But guess what? Even in the middle of your mess, even though I hate your mess, I love you in the middle of your mess. Come on, somebody. Is anybody glad today that there's a God that loves you in the middle of your mess? Listen, here's his invitation to you today. Come to me in the middle of your mess. You don't have to clean yourself up to come to Christ. You come to him and he'll clean you up. You come to him and he'll change you. He'll transform you. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you from the inside out. He'll set you on a new journey. Well, then you'll have the power to be able to repent of your sin and turn from it because he'll give you a new heart. He'll take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Or your desires will begin to change. You come to him, and you come to him as you are. And when you come to him as you are, here's the thing. Some churches, they like to say, come to Jesus as you are. That's great. Come to Christ as you are. But I want to tell you this. You come to him as you are, and you will not stay as you are. You come to him as you are, and he will completely change your life. He will cleanse you from the inside out. Why? Because he loves you in the middle of the mess, but he doesn't love your mess. He wants to change you. He wants to make you a completely brand new person. This is the greatest demonstration of love. He loves powerless people. He loves people in the middle of the mess. But now we need to look at the difference between divine love and human love, which brings me to the second point I want to make today. The difference between divine love and human love. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 to 8, it says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You're like, Josh, why'd you reread that? Well, because I want to zoom in on verse 7 and 8 a little bit more here. Okay, so work with me. Because here's what we see in these two verses. We see the difference between divine love and human love. Human love is shown in in verse 7. Divine love in in verse 8. Here's the difference between divine love and human love. Divine love is God loves you because God is love. God's love is not based on your goodness. It's based on his goodness. Often how we love people as humans is we don't love people according to us being loving and just us out of the goodness of our character, loving them and being kind to them regardless of the character. We love people according to how they treat us. We love people according to who they are, not according to who we are in Christ. That is so often how we treat people when we live according to our natural desires and our sinful and selfish flesh. But what does God do, right? God doesn't love us according to our behavior. He doesn't love, love us according to our goodness. He loves us according to his goodness. And in our natural state, can we just be honest? We don't love people that way when we're in our flesh, when we're in our natural state. We love people if they're nice to us, if they're useful to us, if they've been good to us. If they give us something, that's like, oh, I like that person. I love that person. Oh, but if they've mistreated me, if they've wronged me, I don't like that person. I don't love that person. So I don't want to sacrifice for that person. You don't believe me? Well, let me prove it. Let's just go through a hypothetical situation here. Let's say you are on the Titanic and it is sinking. There's only one lifeboat left. It's already almost full. There's one spot left, and it's between you and one other person. And that other person has committed adultery, they've been a thief, and they've committed murder. What are you going to do in that situation? Well, can we just be honest? In our flesh, we're going to think, if we know that, well, I deserve to live. Why would I lovingly sacrifice my life for this person that I'm better than? They don't deserve it. But then put yourself in that same situation and it's you and one person left, but this person has won the Medal of Honor, they've served the community, and they're a proud father of five. 
Well, even in that situation, let's be honest, you still want to live. <laughs> like, you're like, I would rather be on the lifeboat than like them being on the lifeboat because I, I want to live. But in that situation, right, it's like verse 7 says, you know, for a good person, most per- people, you know, they wouldn't die. But maybe for a really good person, they might die. So in that situation, maybe you think about it. You're like, okay, you know, they're really good. They got a big family. Like, maybe I'll make the sacrifice. You see, so often we love people according to their goodness rather than the goodness that God has done for us. And you see, that's really the, the difference between loving people based off their works and loving people based off of grace. Grace is, I love you even when you don't deserve it. Works is, well, you got to, you know, perform to this certain level, then I'll love you. But here's the incredible thing about God's love for us is it's not based on our performance. And since God's love is not based on your performance, that ought to give you a lot of peace. That regardless of your performance, God loves you. And so you can have peace with God and you can have inner peace knowing that his love is an unfailing love. It is an everlasting love. So there's the difference between human love and divine love. But here's the deal is when you place your faith in Jesus, God forgives you, he indwells you with his spirit, and he fills you with his love so that you can begin to not love like a selfish human anymore. So that you as a human can be filled with divine love and begin to love other people the way Jesus loves you. Which is why Jesus said this in John chapter 13, verse 34 to 35. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. How did God love you? Did he love you according to your works? Did he love you according to your goodness? No, he loved you according to his goodness. So here's the big idea of what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, hey, as I loved you, as I loved you, once you receive that love, I want you to begin to love other people that way. Which means when your spouse has a really bad day and they really mess up, maybe you feel judged by them or maybe you feel wronged by them. Maybe you feel like they sinned against you. That day you love them, but you don't love them because they've been good. You love them because God has been good to you and your love for them is unconditional. When your coworkers or your friends annoy you or they drive you up the wall and you're just having a bad day, you love them. Not because they deserve it, but because God loves you when you don't deserve it. When your neighbor is annoying you and they got that dog that like always barks at one in the morning, it's like, gosh, I wish I could just like slip some poison into their dog's food one day. Right? I just, I'm so annoyed. Like whatever it is, like love them not because they've been good. Love them because God has been good to you. And here's the incredible thing Jesus says here. Jesus says that when you love people in this way, that is how people will know that you're my disciples. When you're a light shining in darkness. Because here's how the world operates. It's transactional. It's business. Well, if you perform for me, I'll perform for you. If you're useful for me, then I will be useful to you. When you love people in an unconditional, no strings attached way, it stands out. One of the most incredible compliments I think I've gotten um, in the last few months as we've been meeting here at Regal is I've had like a handful of employees and one of the managers come up to me and say, hey, you know, I've worked here at Regal for 20 years and we've had different groups come in and out. We've even had some other churches come in and out. And he's like, you guys are my favorite of all time. And he told me why. He's like, you guys are just so nice. Like you guys are so nice to each other and you guys are so nice to us. Like, I love you guys. Like, this is awesome. What is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's not because I'm great. It's not because all of us in the church are great or whatever. It's because God is good. And God has given us a love for one another, and God has given us a love for the world. And when people see that, they notice the difference. And you see, the greatest witness that we can give the world is our love for one another and our love for those that don't love Jesus yet. When we love people in that way, that is the most loudest sermon you could ever preach. So here's the difference between human love and divine love. Human love is based off of performance. Divine love is based off of grace. And our goal is to, number one, receive God's love by faith, but then be transformed by that love so that we begin to love others as Jesus has loved 
us. Now, thirdly, and finally, is what, 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 is the, what is the result of this? What is the result of God's demonstration of love? Well, Romans 5, verse 9 to 11, it says, Since we have now been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received what? Reconciliation. See, God's demonstration of love results in reconciliation. In these three verses I just read to you, one word is used three times, the word reconciliation. What does that word mean? To be reconciled means that there is a relationship that has been restored. There was a relationship that was broken because of sin, but now through Jesus Christ and Him dying on the cross in our place for our sins and rising again when we place our faith in Him, not only are we forgiven, but we're reconciled. Our relationship with God is restored, which means two things here. Firstly, it means that since we're reconciled with God, it means that God is no longer angry at at you over your sins. That's why in verse 9 it talks about that we're actually delivered from the wrath of God. That when you place your faith in Jesus, you're forgiven, you're reconciled, and the reason you're reconciled is because God is no longer angry at you anymore. Because when Jesus was on the cross, he took on the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins. He took on the consequences that we deserve for our sins. He was standing in our place. Our sins were on his shoulders. And so when he died, he died the death that we deserved. But when he rose again, what that means is if we place our faith in him, God can no longer be angry at you. Now, he might discipline you as a loving father disciplines their child, but he will never be angry at you and condemn you to hell or turn his back on you. He will always stand by your side. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. How many here know that it's impossible to be 100% reconciled to a person while at the same time being deeply angry at them and bitter at them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's completely impossible. And some of you know this because the holidays are coming up. Thanksgiving is coming up, Christmas is coming up, and there are some family members in your life that you refuse to spend the holidays with, or they refuse to spend them with you because you're angry at one another. Ooh, I'm getting to somebody's business right now. You're bitter at one another. You cannot be reconciled to somebody completely when you harbor anger in your heart. And here's the incredible thing. Through the gospel, God is no longer angry at you, and he never will be for your sins if you place your faith in Jesus. So the result of that, what is it? Reconciliation. Restored relationship. You see, anger causes separation. The gospel causes reconciliation. And through Christ, your relationship with God can be restored. No longer separation, but restoration, reconciliation. You're brought to God in relationship forever, which means this, secondly, I want to bring this up. Is that if you place your faith in Jesus and you experience reconciliation, you experience restoration in your relationship with God, it means that you now have a relationship with God that you were meant to walk deeper in and grow in the rest of your life. Like the gospel isn't like, okay, you're forgiven and now you're reconciled and, you know, live as if God doesn't exist. The whole point of reconciliation, the whole point of having restored relationship is so that you walk in that relationship every day, moment by moment. It's like if a married couple got divorced. Maybe there was infidelity. Maybe both people committed adultery or something. And so they're divorced, they're separated, but then, by the grace of God, restoration happens. Reconciliation happens. And they throw a big party, and they, they have a, a, a second wedding ceremony, and, and they reconcile together, and it's this incredible thing. Well, here's what you would expect after that, if they've restored the relationship, if they've reconciled. You'd expect that they'd be living together again. You wouldn't expect that, oh, they're reconciled, but now they're still living separated. 
No, the whole point of reconciliation is now we live together again. We're doing life together again. Like we're in one another's lives in a very deep way. And you see, the whole point of being reconciled to God isn't so that you could just have this fire insurance where you know you're not going to hell when you die. The whole point is you're reconciled to God here and now. The good news is here and now. You can be reconciled to God here and now, which means every single day you can walk in relationship with God. And it starts every morning when you wake up and you open the Bible so that God can speak to you and then you pray to him so that you can speak to him. And as you go throughout your day, walking by the Spirit, knowing that not only are you forgiven by God, but you're filled by the Holy Spirit. And the God that loves you and sacrificed for you is now within you. And you can walk with him. And it's a personal relationship. The gospel is not this concept. It's not this transaction where, you know, I I have this intellectual assent and then God forgives me and then I'm good and I live however I want. No, the gospel is I trust in Jesus with all my heart to save me because I'm powerless and I'm a sinner and I can't help myself, but I throw my, my whole life into his hands and I allow him to save me. I allow him to reconcile me to God. And now that I'm reconciled with God, I walk with him. This relationship has been restored, and now this relationship is the center of my life. This relationship determines how I walk in all my other relationships. This relationship is literally the foundation of my life. And here's the incredible good news of the gospel, is that when you're reconciled to God, He also then begins to entrust you with the ministry of reconciliation which is what the Apostle Paul writes about in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, when he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone and the new is here. All this is from God who what? You can say it. That wasn't bad. Who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I just want to implore you, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you've never been restored to God and your relationship with Him. I want to, as the Apostle Paul just said here, I want to implore you, I want to ask of you, be reconciled to God today. Today is the day of salvation. Do not wait another moment to be reconciled to God. He died for you in the past, but His love for you can transform you in the present. And right now, he's offering his hand of relationship to you. But he will not force your hand. Because here's the thing. Offering reconciliation and offering forgiveness takes one. But receiving reconciliation takes two. You have to receive it, and you receive it by faith. You receive it by coming to Christ and saying, Jesus, I open my heart to you. But if you're here and you've already been reconciled to God, you're a Christian, you've already placed your faith in Jesus, I got news for you. God has not just reconciled you, but now he has given you the ministry of reconciliation. Which means now it is not just your job, it is your duty, it is your pleasure, it is your joy, it is your honor to tell other people about Jesus, to invite people to Christ, to invite people to the church, to live on mission. In the Bay Area, it is so easy to get wrapped up in our busyness and in our wealth and all the pleasures and you know, traveling to all these different spots to get food and, you know, trying to get the next promotion and all these things. When really what our life is all about as believers is the ministry of reconciliation. The reason why I exist here on this planet is to grow in my relationship with God and to help people that don't yet have that relationship start it. And for those that already have that relationship, to strengthen it. That's why I'm here. That's why you are here, is to get in a relationship with God, grow in that relationship with God, help other people start that relationship with God, and then help them strengthen it once they have it. That's the ministry of reconciliation. 
And by the way, the ministry of reconciliation isn't just evangelism. It's not just telling people about Jesus that don't know about Jesus. And by the way, you ought to do that. In fact, Thanksgiving and Christmas is coming up. It's a great time to share the gospel when you're around the table with your family members and friends that don't yet know Jesus. Or maybe when they're in town, hey, you want to come to church with us on Christmas Eve? You want to come to church with us this weekend And when you're in town? Do that. It's an incredible opportunity. You don't have to be awkward about it or pushy about it, but just take a step of faith and see what God does. They might be closed off to it. They might be open to it. You don't know the state of their heart until you try. So go out and do it. But it's not just evangelism. The ministry of reconciliation also means since through God's grace you've been reconciled to God, your relationship has been restored, you ought to be reconciling your relationships with people in your life and helping other people do the same. So who is it in your life that maybe you have a broken relationship with? Now, I'm not saying you have to fully trust everybody if they've hurt you really bad. There's some people where you just forgive them, but you don't have to fully trust them. But who's the person in your life where you need to do the work of reconciliation? You need to forgive them, and you need to extend that hand of relationship so that that relationship can be restored. There are some people here, I just felt the Holy Spirit speak to me on this. I think there's somebody here that you have a marriage There's somebody here that has a marriage that needs reconciliation, and maybe you're not divorced yet, but you've thought about it, or the other person's thought about it, and I think what the Holy Spirit wants you to hear right now is Jesus Christ offered free reconciliation to you by his grace, and by his grace, since he can reconcile your relationship with him, he wants to reconcile your relationship with your spouse. He can do that. God can do incredible things. God is in the business of reconciliation. He's in the business of us, he's bridging the gap between us and God and bridging the gap between us and others. That's what he does. He's in the business of reconciliation. Why? Because that's how he demonstrates his love for us. You see, friends, when we look to the cross, this is what we see. We see the greatest demonstration of love ever. How did he demonstrate his love for us? He demonstrated his love for us by dying, by sacrificially giving up his life for powerless sinners that didn't want anything to do with him. And you see, this greatest demonstration of love deserves a response. Are you here and you don't know Christ? Are you still sinning and separated from him? Come to him by faith today. If you've already been reconciled to God, but maybe you've been reconciled to God, but maybe you haven't been walking in that relationship as closely as you could be or should be. Today, draw near to the God that has already drawn near to you. And maybe there are times in your life where you feel like, I just feel far from God's love. I don't earn, I don't, I don't deserve God's love. I don't, I don't deserve God being in my life. I feel unworthy. The next time you feel that or think that in your life, I want you to remind yourself of this verse, Romans 5, verse 8. Yeah, I feel this way. But God, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Are you feeling unworthy? But God demonstrates his love for you in this. Through him, you are worthy. Do you feel unqualified like God cannot use you? I feel unqualified, but God says he can qualify you through Jesus Christ. Do you feel like you don't love God enough that your your love for him often becomes cold, but God loves you when you don't love him? And he can fill you with a love so that you can begin to love him and love others. Look to the greatest demonstration of love, and as you look to the greatest demonstration of love, it will change your life. Let's pray. And I want to just say a prayer of receiving God's love receiving reconciliation. And if you're here today and you've never received Jesus' love into your life in a real and tangible way, I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me in your heart. It's also going to be a prayer of reconciliation. So if you're here today and maybe you need to be reconciled to somebody, maybe you need to just walk closer in the relationship with God whom you've already been reconciled with, I want you to pray this prayer too. You could pray something like this in your heart. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you loved me in the middle of my mess. Lord, today I'm coming to you by faith, trusting 
that you're the only one that has the power to save. And Lord, I'm asking that since I am now reconciled to you, Lord, would you help me in the ministry of reconciliation? Lord, to be reconciled to the people in my life and also, Lord, to be a person that shares your good news with others so that they too might be reconciled to you. Lord, I thank you that all these things we've already said today, it's all by grace. You don't have to earn it. So Lord, in this, mor- in this morning and in this time, I just rest, I recline. I receive your love and your grace as a free gift and I thank you for it. It's in Christ's name. Everybody said... Amen.